hear a, a last message that way. So um, if you could, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. We'll begin at verse 18. And uh, it's really, really cool how God works things out and how God works the timing of things out. But I think this is uh, just a perfect day to think about the Great Commission and think about what we're called to do as Christians, especially in light of what we've just heard from the high school students and what they've been doing as far as sharing the love of Christ. And so um, I think it's going to tie in beautifully with the rest of the service as well. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're starting a new series this morning, and um, I want to begin with this statement. As a general rule... Simpler is better. As a general rule, simpler is better. This series is going to be based on uh, a book that, uh, that Tom Rayner wrote. It's a book called Simple Church, and um, it's uh, a book that, that describes how churches that tend to be extremely complicated, have more programs than they can staff, have, have more staff that they can pay, have more buildings than they can heat, have more things going on than they should tend not to do as well as churches that keep things pretty simple, that keep things uh, pretty focused on what Jesus taught us to do, pretty focused on, on being able to, to see uh, what God is, is, is doing through us and how we're supposed to um, be as a church. And so uh, throughout this Sunday and the next two Sundays, we're going to be thinking about this concept of, of simple church. And, and some of the examples that the authors give in the book is uh, maybe you recognize this logo. Um, that's the Apple logo, but that's the old Apple logo. Uh, some of us can remember back when, when uh, Apple IIEs came out. We had those in my, in my grade school classroom. You could play Math Blaster on them and stuff. It was so much fun. Um, but that old Apple logo, it's changed from that to this. Right? And so you, you go on apple.com today, you'll see in the upper left corner, the logo they have is so much simpler than the one that they used to have. Or, or you think about uh, Southwest Airlines. Right? And Southwest Airlines became famous and has done incredibly well. And even to this day, they still advertise. The reason they do so well is because there's no additional baggage fees. There's no additional peanut fees. There's no additional soft drink fees. And all these kinds of things that crop up when you go with any other airline, Southwest says, we keep it simple. And so I was going to put their logo up um, because that's you know Southwest logo and there's their plane and everything. But they've made it even simpler. I, I found this one instead. Um, no mention of airlines, no picture even of an airplane. It's just got their signature three colors that you see on every Southwest plane that flies overhead going to Midway. We could talk about cell phone plans, right? Unlimited plans now are all the rage because you never have to worry about going over in your minutes. You never have to worry about going over in your data. You never have to worry about roaming or overages or extra fees. It's all a single unlimited plan. We could think about wedding advice that people give sometimes when a new couple is getting married, and sometimes the best advice is the simple advice. Advice like, don't go to bed angry. Advice like, pray together. Advice like, laugh with each other. Have a good time. It's fun to be married, right? Those simple little pieces of advice are sometimes better than a 600-page book on what marriage is supposed to be about. Even some of the great minds in history knew about the importance of simplicity. Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. We think about the architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said, organic architecture seeks superior sense of use and a finer sense of comfort expressed in organic simplicity. It's a really complicated way to say that he really likes things simple, right? It's kind of ironic. Um, <laughs> but it's not just the outside world that focuses on simplicity. I would argue that Jesus himself brings a simple message of hope in the gospel. 
Because when we think about what Jesus said, what we find is that our first calling is loving God. And for us, we might say, of course we know that. That's what Jesus taught. That's what we've learned in church for years and years. But, but think about the context in which Jesus said, this is the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Think about the context in which that took place. This was a time when the Jewish religious leaders, all the rage was thinking about rules. All the rage was thinking about the laws. All the rage was thinking, how do we have more rules in order to make sure that God is going to love us? And so they had, as it turns out, 613 total laws, one for each letter in the Ten Commandments. Right? They, they devised this in their minds. Okay, there's 613 letters in the Ten Commandments. Let's find 613 laws in the first five books in the Pentateuch of the Old Testament. 248 of those laws were affirmative ones because in their understanding, they didn't have anatomy and physiology like we do in college today, but they understood that there were 248 parts of the body. And so they said, let's have 248 positive laws of things that our people are supposed to do. And if you're doing the math in your head, and you might be right now, that leaves 365 negative laws, one for each day of the year. All, right? All these things that we should not do, that we're forbidden to do. They spent their days debating about whether the number was correct, whether their classifications were accurate, if the laws fit in the correct subcategories. And in bursts Jesus onto the scene. And he corrects the leaders and he speaks in powerful ways, not only about the law, but about himself. And it absolutely astonishes the people. Abraham lived and how Jesus is. They were astonished at his teaching. Other translations say amazed at his teaching. Wow, who is this guy? So the religious leaders want to do something about it, right? They, they want to catch Jesus in his teaching. And so the Bible says that they, they gathered together and they, they said, how do we set a trap for Jesus? How are we going to catch him? And so they sent a lawyer to go talk with Jesus to try to catch him. And it's, it's not like a lawyer today who's going to find some malpractice suit or something like that. But this is a lawyer who was knowledgeable in the law, right? Law, lawyer, right? And so Jesus gets this question from him. Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God. The first and greatest thing that we have to do. But we know it's different than that. Because it doesn't start on our behalf. It doesn't start with what we do, but it starts with what God did. And what we find when we look at the bigger picture of Scripture is that God's love drives out fear and then we love. It doesn't start with us loving God, but it starts with the loving God showing his love to us. That's what 1 John 4 says. Verse 16 says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In verse 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives fear because fear has to do with punishment. What John is talking about with laws that, that sometimes just almost seem like we're grasping for straws, trying to justify ourselves, trying to say, look, I'm doing it right. Look, I'm keeping it perfectly. Look, God has to love me for the way that I'm living. When we live like that, we live in fear. Because any misstep, any word that we say that's not quite right, any, any desire or thought that goes off in the wrong direction, we've blown it. A sense of, of fear. Because we say that punishment. Then he wrote, we celebrate the resurrection to say that death doesn't have the final word. But when we're found in Christ, we have that new life too. Even though a person dies, yet they will live. This is the gospel. And John says, when we know this, when we know this kind of love, it drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. What does John say next in verse 19? We love because he first loved us, right? He showed his love in Jesus Christ, and as a result, now we love. One of the ways that we love God, our next point, is by obeying. By obeying. It's the cadet verse, we heard it last week as well. It's John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And we could talk about different ways that followers of Christ obey him. 
we could talk about the way that, that Jesus sacrificed and gave of himself and how we should sacrifice and give of ourselves. We could talk about the way that Jesus was committed to prayer, that he went off in these lonely and desolate places to pray for, for himself and for those who were with him, to, to know that God's grace and strength was going to get him through. We could talk about that this morning. We could talk about his care and love for the poor and those who are on the fringes of society, the way that he took the outcast under his wing, the way that he, he loved people who society said were completely unlovable. We could talk about all those kinds of things this morning, but I want to focus on just one thing this morning, and that's Jesus' words in the Great Commission. Go, baptizing people of all nations. Tell them about who I am. Teach them about me, Jesus Christ. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make disciples. Right? This is a matter of obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. This these clear marching orders, clear command in Matthew 20. Make disciples a way to show that we are loved by God. Some has once said to share with look like. pain meds are going to run out. And so I'd, I'd, I'd try to, you know, okay, what could I watch on Netflix for a couple hours? What do I have on the DVR that I could watch? Maybe there's some new seasons or new shows that I could watch. Or maybe there's a book that someone's recommended that I could, you know, check it out on, on you know, the Kindle and be able to read that and that sort of thing. And so I found that uh, for, for big patches of the last six months of my life, what I found is that I'm just trying to get from one hour to the next, from Monday to Sunday, and, and just trying to, to basically make the time pass, right? What can I do because this season and this time where you, know, you can't do a whole lot, and it's really kind of debilitating and frustrating to be in a situation like that, but it just... It just felt like, you know, all I'm trying to do is, is give myself a little bit of entertainment or distraction or a little something. Have that. Just get through another day to pass the hours, to, to make the time go by. And sometimes that happens in retirement. Sometimes that happens during summer break when you're done with school. Sometimes that happens even on, on weekends where you just... When, when you're in a season like that and when you're in a time like that, man, it is, it's the worst feeling. It's a feeling of, of complete purposelessness, right? A way to avoid feeling like you're something to do. It's not just to, to waste our time to make one day go into the next and one week into the next and just hope the time goes kind of quickly, but instead to say, God, I want to use every hour I have. God, I want to share with a dead and dying world the hope of the gospel. They need it now more than ever. God, I want to... I want to you because I want to love you. I was thinking that word he says, go, I'm sending you out, right? This is not for someone else to do, but this is your work to do. And as I said, this isn't something that is, is so heavy and so burdensome that we say, oh man, this is just another, you know, this is a 614th law that I have to follow now. No, this comes out of the love we have for God because of the love that God showed to us. This comes out of the way that we want to obey God because to obey him is to love him, right? This is a way for us to show how thankful we are for what Jesus has done in our lives and to say, I want you to have the hope of that gospel as well. And so in closing... Pray and obey as we share the good news. Pray and obey. To say, God, please send the workers. God, please send people out there. And God, please let that person be me. God, please let the soil be ready. God, please. 
have a kingdom impact, to share your gospel, to transform the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray?